classical Christian thinking, truth and beauty and goodness, of course, belong together. God's truth is God's being. God is what he is. And the ultimate truth about the universe is that God is the way he is as revealed to us in Jesus Christ. He is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He is an endless circulation of unconditional love. But in that love is the consciousness of delight. God is joyful. Not something we say often enough. But I remember a, a Roman Catholic preacher I heard many years ago saying, you've got to remember, God loves being God. He's having a whale of a time. And we learn our joy by being drawn into God's joy. It's actually there in the fourth gospel, in the farewell discourses. But God forgive us, we, we ignore it at our peril. So, insofar as beauty is one of the things that expands our hearts into joy, it belongs with the truth and the goodness of God. And what we learn from the experience of the beautiful, in art or in nature, is to have our rather boring and prosaic habits of mind and heart broken open a bit, our horizons broadened, the world renewed. Beauty sometimes challenges and shocks us because we've got used to low expectations of who we are and what the world is like. So I'd say beauty and truth in the discovery of God do indeed belong together. Challenging question here about why the hierarchy of the Christian churches are afraid of stating clearly their own Christian faith. Are the leaders of the churches too agnostic or even atheistic as compared to the ordinary person who does believe, who accepts miracles, who accepts the hope of heaven? Has the hierarchy given way to a pick-and-mix mentality? Well, I don't think so. But then I would say that, wouldn't I? I don't think so. I think that the hierarchy, who, whoever they are, but I presume it includes bishops and archbishops, the hierarchy make a solemn statement, as do other clergy, when they're admitted to office, that they accept the Catholic faith, the truth delivered to the Church of England, which we have to try and express afresh in every generation. That's the foundation of who we are and what we do. And it's what we seek to do as pastors and as leaders in the church whenever we preside at worship. We seek in that event of worship to bring the threefold God alive, or that's a blasphemous statement, to bring the life of the threefold God into the life that is here among us. So I would be very sorry if I thought the hierarchy or anybody else were somehow reluctant to be clear about the life-changing, inexhaustible depth of the God who is made known to us in Jesus Christ as Father, Son, and Spirit. Reluctant to think that the hierarchy or anyone else lived in a world where the shock and surprise of miracle was held to be impossible. I think it's true that, as, as is hinted in the question, reports that you sometimes come across in the media about what bishops think or say don't um, paint a very encouraging picture, though I guess that even that is looking back to one or two celebrity cases of bishops saying controversial things in public. So I don't think that we've got quite such a crisis with the hierarchy as might be suggested. The pick and mix phrase is, yes, I and mean, that's a challenge. I think an attitude to Christian doctrine which simply says, well, I like this bit and I don't like that bit, 
isn't very satisfactory because I believe the doctrine of the creed hangs together. If you understand one bit of it, you know, the rest makes sense. And I think, sadly, one of the things we have lost sight of overall in the church is the feeling for the big picture, whether it's in reading the Bible or in our approach to doctrine. We get held up on this or that detail, and we don't see how it hangs together. I would be very happy to think that the church was more committed to teaching the wholeness of that picture, the creedal picture, and how it hangs together. Now then, when you refer to church, were you speaking to the Church of England or Christendom? It would be rather nice to say I was speaking to Christendom, to everybody, but uh, I am also thinking of the church that I serve and minister in and starting there. But I think when I, when I was using the word the church in my remarks earlier on, I was actually thinking of the church, you know, the community of Christ's disciples, whatever they call themselves. Here's one from a 16-year-old. I serve in church. I'm a member of our deanery youth group, but the church hierarchy don't seem to be interested in us. How could this be improved? When I'm asked that sort of question, one of the first things I, I'm always inclined to say is, to, to the church, to myself, to the hierarchy again, is don't patronize younger believers. Expect the best and the fullest of them. Expect them to have a gift to give. Don't look down on them. Don't try and keep them quiet or keep them entertained. Treat them seriously as people who, like you, are growing up in faith. That seems to me that the basic principle for approaching work with younger Christians. And of course, it's a point that's often made, it needs to be made again. It's not true that young people are the church of the future. They are the church. They are part of the church now. Therefore, our brothers and sisters, therefore, deserving of the utmost seriousness and attention and respect. And any, I haven't got any detailed positive recommendations because that would take rather a long time, but at least the negative thing you can say is, if you bear that in mind, there are things you will not do, like patronize, like entertain. You will listen, take seriously, expect the best. Would I agree that Christianity is a materialistic religion? Nice question. Um, I think it was Archbishop William Temple who said that Christianity is the most materialistic of the great religions. And I think he meant by that that the Christian gospel tells us A, that God made a world that is good, B, that God works out his purposes through material things and agents, through these lumps of bone and flesh and stuff that you and I are, and above all, that his supreme self-expression in the world was not through an idea in people's heads, but through the word made flesh, through Jesus, who was a lump of bone and flesh like us. That's materialistic. And because Jesus himself, in breaking bread and pouring wine, said to his friends, this is how you are in touch with me, as much as if I were literally the food you ate, Jesus was telling us to be materialistic, not to ignore that plain breaking of bread together which binds us in him through material means. So yes, a materialistic religion which says to the world around, the problem is not that you're materialists, but that you're not materialist enough. You don't have as high a doctrine of matter, stuff, as you ought to, because the matter, the stuff of the world, is capable of speaking the love and the meaning of God. Forget that at your peril. And of course, when we look around and think about the environmental crisis of our day, that's exactly